Chapter 1 Meeting It was nighttime in the great village of Kanagakur, and three figures could be seen standing on top of the outer wall of the village. They all wore the same black cloaks with red cloud patterns, shinobi sandals, and a ring around their finger. One had the symbol of zero, one the symbol of green, and one of the symbol of north. Zero, Sei and Hoku. The first of the three figures had shoulder-length red hair with a single bang hanging over one eye, a sickly pale complexion, and strange rippled eyes. The second was slightly shorter with blonde hair and a long ponytail, blue eyes, and a near-psychotic smirk plastered across his face while the last one was the tallest of the three, with a whopping 6.7 feet, strange pupilless eyes with green irises and red scara formed in a permanent scowl, a dark skin tone, and long shaggy brown hair. His mouth was covered in a black cloth. Leader Sama, remind me why we're here again, hmm, the blonde questioned the redhead. The leader looked up, and his mouth formed a thin line. Because my spy network has spotted the nine-tailed Jinchuriki in this damnable village. He's still young, so he should be an easy capture, isn't that right, Kakuzu, the redhead answered. Still looking down at the village with a harsh glare. The tan giant grinned under his face mask. Indeed, Nagato. He should be an easy capture, plus if we take him down first, the other bijou should be easy as well. He replied in his low raspy voice. The blonde boy looked up and grinned at the leader. Can I dash? No, Didara, you cannot blow anything up. Nagato interrupted the now pouting 15-year-old. They jumped down and ran through the alleyways as music could be heard from the center of the village. It was October 10th, meaning that the festival of the 4th was going on. It had been one year since the fourth Hokage sacrificed himself to kill the Kyubi no Yoko and save the village from its demise. In the distance, shouts, laughter, and singing could be heard, but the three members of Akatsuki paid no heed to it as they made their way to their designation, the old orphanage where their prize was waiting to be claimed. Nagato stopped in the alleyway across the orphanage and gave the others the signal to wait. The two shot him questionable glances. Nagato did not turn around as he started to speak. You know, I used to have a twin sister. Her name was Kushina. Deidara raised an eyebrow. So what? What does your sister have to do with this, hmm? She's already dead, isn't she? Nagato nodded. Yes, she is, but her son isn't. He's in there. He is the nine-tailed Jinchuriki, Uzumaki Naruto is my cousin. He suddenly turned around, his renegade flaring at full force. I will protect him against ourselves, please don't hold this against me. Before they could move, Nagato activated his human and Naraka paths, ripping out their chakra and memories about how to use Jetsus. He sealed them into a scroll and used his Preta path to summon the King of Hell. He threw the two stunned men into its mouth. As it retracted into the ground, he could hear the blood-curling screams of the two unfortunate hellbound men. He deactivated his three paths and undid his black robe. The redhead then used a small katan jutsu to turn the coat into ashes. When he was done, he crossed the street and entered the small house. For about twenty minutes, he searched the place for his nephew's whereabouts until he found the toddler sleeping in the closet. He was underfed and had multiple scars running across his body. Nagato grimaced at the pitiful sight of his kid nephew. Hey there, squirt. I'm normally not much of a talker, so I won't give you a speech while you're sleeping. You will face impossible hardships if you stay here. All I want to say is, sorry for not being there for you, kid. Goodbye. He then did the impossible thing. He ripped his own chakra from his body and let it run into the sleeping boy. When he was nearly out of chakra, he made a ram seal, and once again the king of hell appeared. Nagato picked the boy up, walked into the king of hell, and ordered it to open up in a different dimension. As the jaws of the beast opened up, he looked around. To his right was a cave, and to his left a magma field. 
Taking his chances, he wobbled over to the cave. I won't survive for very long here. I need to hurry and find him apparent before Dash. His thoughts were interrupted by a deep rumble. Nagato looked up to see an immense creature. It looked like a gigantic lizard, with brown, rocky skin with red glowing veins running across its body, yellow eyes, and humongous wings. Its teeth were yellowish, sharp, and looked like they could hurt like a bitch. The strangest thing about the creature was, though that with intervals, steam shot out of its back, like a geyser. The creature looked Nagato dead in the eyes, before lowering its gaze to the sleeping Naruto. It pointed its sharp black claw to the child. Human, why did you bring this hatchling here? It spoke in a surprisingly gentle feminine tone. The beast sounded honestly surprised, for no one dared to enter her ancient territory. Nagato quirked an eyebrow at the still unidentified beast. Let me counter that question with another question, noble beast. Who are you? The beast rumbled again, however this time it sounded like a chuckle. You have guts, human. I like that very well. My name is Fiamma, the great magma dragon. My power is only outmatched by Agmelogia, and I am only matched by the bastard Igneal. Now answer my question. The dragon responded. Nagato nodded and raised the still sleeping bundle. This is my nephew. I will not beat around the bush and be honest. I am dying because of my disease, and little Naruto here has nobody left but me. In his village he was hated for something he had no control over, so I took him with me to find the kid some suitable parents before I kicked the bucket. Which is somewhere between one hour and one day from now. I can feel myself grow weaker by the minute. The dragon nodded and lowered her head towards the toddler. She took a deep whiff before grumbling and nodding to herself. Human. This child has some seriously powerful and dense magic potential. Close to that of a wizard saint. No idea what she's talking about, but I take it that's a good thing. Fiamma nodded again as if confirming something in her head. She showed the man a disarming toothy grin. Very well. As it is right now, cultists will notice his potential if he's led into the human parts of the world and kidnap him to turn him into a mindless slave for their sick plans. Nagato lowered his gaze, feeling guilty for exposing Naruto yet again to danger. However, I cannot simply stand by to see a child so young be broken, tortured, and orphaned. Besides, he will need some serious training if he doesn't want to literally explode in a magic burst. Therefore, I shall take him under my wing to raise and train him in my own magics, the lost arts of magma dragon slayer magic, iron mag magic, and stone mag magic. Nagato raised his gaze again in shock. A dragon, raising a human? How's that even possible? As if reading his mind, Fiamma grinned again. Though uncommon, it is not unheard of that a child is being raised by dragons. We have strong parental instincts, and often see human children as our own hatchlings. Plus Dragon Slayer, while exhausting, is considered as one of the five most powerful magic types in this world. Only topped by God Slayer magic and Death magic. However, Death magic is forbidden, and God Slayers are often quite demented people with a twisted view on the world. Nagato smiled at the rock-scaled giant. If you are sure that you want to raise Naruto, then I do not have any choice then to trust you. Fiamma, thank you. I have one final tea dash was all he could say before he lurched forward and gripped his heart and coughing up a lot of blood. Shit, huff, I see that, huff, my time is, huff, up, he wheezed. He reached in his shirt and pulled out a scroll. This contains the powers, huff, of two powerful men that tried to, huff, kill Naruto. One power contains the power of, huff, explosions, while the other holds, huff, elemental control over fire, water, earth, wind, huff, and lightning. Give it to Naruto when you deem him, huff, smart enough to not blow his own head off, huff, with a piece of rock. 
I gave him my powers to, huff, control gravity, and turn himself into, huff, a living machine at will. He placed both the sleeping child and the scroll in the massive hand of Fiamma before coughing another storm of blood. He summoned the king of hell again and stepped in. Whatever you will do with your life, Naruto is your choice. Live well. Love well. And be the most powerful mage you can be, Naruto. Farewell. With that, Nagato let out his last breath and fell forward into the jaws of the king of hell. The head closed its mouth and dispelled itself to sleep until the next bearer of the Renegade would summon him. Fiamma looked down at the young child that woke up during Nagato's coughing fit. Naruto looked up with big blue eyes full of curiosity and innocence at the big thing that stared at him. He gurgled a bit and put his arms up, gripping one of her claws. He giggled a bit and Fiamma chuckled for a bit. Not afraid of me, eh? I can see that you will be a real powerful mage when I'm done with you. Seven years later, Fiori, X770. Wow. Boom. Fiamma facepalmed as she watched the adopted son blow up, yet another stone golem with a magma-infused punch, but it blew up in his face and he was, yet again hurled into one of the many magma pools. After about two seconds, he shot out of it again, his pants on fire, and magma dripping off of his skin. Shit that hurts, he roared angrily. Okay. Now it's enough the blonde roared at the still-moving golems, who turned to him. Naruto bent down and began to inhale the magma under his feet, healing his wounds and refilling his strength. You're you know. Huko, he roared as a small blob of molten rock flew towards his opponents. The blob hit one of the golems in the chest and started to melt through it. The golem grumbled before succumbing to gravity, falling down and not getting up again. Soon the golem sank back into the ground in order to become a lifeless chunk of rock once again. Fiamma nodded approvingly. True. The golem was only one thousandth of her own power, but even some adult mages had trouble defeating only one. Naruto defeated two of them in under five minutes. Hey, Fiamma Kachin. Did you see that? I finally did a roar. Naruto jumped up and down in excitement his slitted blue eyes glimmering in pride and his sharp toothy grin showing. Very good, Sochi. However, you still lack the necessary firepower behind it. For now, I want you to use your iron mate to make some targets and repeatedly fire your roar at them. If you can melt 40 targets in one shot, I'll give you something awesome. Got it? The eight-year-old was incredibly esthetic at the prospect of a gift, so he went to work. Iron make, steel pillars, immediately fifty pillars shot out of the ground and walls, and the kid went back to work. Fiamma watched in great pride how the child's attack grew larger and stronger with every shot. By the end of the day, Naruto could destroy four pillars in one shot. Disappointed that he hadn't reached his goal yet, he went to bed. Did set on getting his goal the next day. And done. First chapter up. Next chapter will be up soon. Here is a list of magic that he will learn for sure. Magma Dragon Slayer Earth Make Iron Make Explosion Magic Dash 5 Element Magic Slight Titan Magic Partial Gravity Magic Nature Magic Machine Magic Light Magic Chapter 2 Farewells Hey, Fiamma Kachin. Where are we going? An 11-year-old Naruto asked as Fiamma walked out of the cave. The ancient dragon looked over her shoulder as the blonde child met her gaze. You need experience with the outside world, Naruto. I am going nowhere. But you are. She said in her usual gentle tone. Naruto immediately froze up in panic. I is she kicking me out? S she can't be serious, right? I haven't done anything wrong yet. B but Kachin, why, he asked weakly, not believing that she was actually kicking him out of the nest. Fiamma looked at the confused, sad hatchling that she raised with pity in her eyes. 
She raised a claw. Pointing it at Naruto's chest, she spoke up in a quivering voice. Naruto. My child. My little hatchling. For the past ten years, you have been the only light in my life. My raison d'etre, my reason of existence. For ten years, you kept me company, you laughed with me, you trained with me. I've taught you almost everything a true dragon slayer should know. You are strong, yet kind. Wise, yet innocent. Hardworking, yet loving. And pretty fucking damn cute for human standards too, she chuckled a bit before continuing. You will attract a lot of mates, and grant me lots of cute little hatchlings for me to spoil. However, as powerful as we dragons get, we too, have our weaknesses. One of which is time. We grow old, slower than humans of course, but we do grow older. I have lived for six millennia, Naruto. I am afraid, my time is up. Naruto was now openly crying. He croaked when he heard the last four words. No. You can't die. I, I don't want you to die. I need you here. With me. I want you Tio train me, Tio laugh with me, Tio cry with me. He settled down a bit, but cried harder. You've taken care of me for as long as I can remember. You are my mother. I am your son. Please don't go. Don't die. I love you, Mom. Please, don't leave me. By now, Fiamma was also openly crying molten stone as she patted his head and caressed his whiskered cheek with one claw. You are by far the most compassionate, loving young man I have ever had the pleasure of knowing. Naruto Kuen I love you too, my student. My son. My little gift to the world. But know this. She poked her claw in his chest, where his heart was. I will never truly leave you, as long as you'll remember me, I will always be with you. Right there, in your heart. Now, before you leave, I have a few gifts for you. She extended her other claw, and rolled four objects onto the ground. One was an obsidian black blade. It had an odd-shaped tip, and its guard and hilt were in the shape of three dragon heads the blade radiated power, the same power as Fiamma herself. The second item was a silver battle axe with a black stone hilt. It was short, but Naruto knew that it would come in handy. The blade was decorated with a crawling dragon on it. Like the blade, it felt like Fiamma was lying there. The third item was a silver throwing dagger it was thin, but had a thick handle. On the back was an extra small blade for surprise attacks. Like the first two objects, it radiated Fiamma's power. The fourth object, however, was the strangest item of all. And looked like a very old scroll of paper of some sorts. It radiated great power, but it felt different than Fiamma's. Something stirred in his stomach when he looked at it. What are those, Kachin? Fiamma crouched down and pointed at the three weapons. These are three weapons I made from my own scales. They have been forged in my own fires, and the decorations were made by my own claws. This way, even in death, I will be with you. They are a part of me, so if you ever feel alone, just send your energy into them, and my essence will react to them. They are powerful weapons that enhance your slayer arts, so if you are in danger they will grant you a great boost of power. The scroll was the last gift from the dying man that brought you to me. The last gift that your uncle gave you. He told me that when the time is ripe and you open the scroll, it will grant you a part of his own memories and tremendous power. I believe that that time is here, and now. Open the scroll, and whatever happens. Don't back down. Naruto nodded, and he touched the scroll. As soon as he did, though, it unsealed itself and sprang open. When it opened, three rays of light shot out of it and hit Naruto square in the chest. When the lights hit him, he became overloaded with memories. Happy memories, sad memories, and knowledge. Tons of techniques rooted themselves into his brain as if he had been taught them for years. 
knowledge of assassination, explosions, capturing things dead or alive, sculpting, human anatomy, unknown fighting styles, elemental control, people, places, gods, eyes, and demons. He felt as if his head was going to split open because of all the information being bombarded into his young mind. However, two memories stood out the most. A red-headed ten-year-old child was reading old books in the library when he found his own name. Uzumaki Nagato. Sister, Uzumaki Kushina. Mother, Uzumaki Meharu. Father, Uzumaki Jinryusei. The second memory was a simple talk. It was the last conversation that his uncle had with Fiamma before he died. After the lights were completely absorbed, Fiamma noticed that Naruto had physically changed a bit. His hair was longer now, and he had grown a little bit. His muscles had adapted themselves to the memories of the Taijutsu styles, giving him a more lean, compacted build. His eyes had shifted from their slitted blue to a slightly purplish color. His slitted pupils now had two rings around them. The most noticeable, though, was the fact that he now had a mouth embedded in his left hand, and his right arm had torn its left apart and then repaired with black threads. Out of the scroll fell two objects. One was a long black cloak with red clouds on them, while the second object was a small ring with a blue gem on it. Inside the gem was the word zero carved. He smiled. Thanks for everything, Kachin. From training me to giving me my heritage. He was now crying with a smile on his face. No matter who my family was, you will always be my real mother. I love you. Fiamma smiled again, tears flowing down her face. And I love you, Naruto. Now go. A few miles from here, there's a human resort called Akane Resort. You should go there first, and then ask them about a wizard guild named Fairy Tail. Their first master was friend of mine, and I know they will treat you well, my child. Never forget me, for I will never forget you in the afterlife. Goodbye, my child. And with that, she turned around to return to the cave that they had lived in for ten years. Naruto grabbed the three weapons and sealed them inside the scroll. He put on the cloak and attached the cloak to his back, put on the ring, and walked the long road down the mountain that he had called home. Tears still cascaded down his face as he thought, I will make you proud, mother. Fairy tale, here I come. Chapter 3, Slaves of the Tower of Heaven Part 1, Arrival As Naruto walked down the road to Akane Resort, he kept having headaches. He kept getting memories of the three men whose power he got. He found a lot in those memories that made him glad that Nagato brought him to Earthland. The first man was a 16-year-old teenager called Daidara. Daidara originated from the hidden village of Wagakure. He was the apprentice of the village's leader, but betrayed him after an argument where the leader called Daidara's Jetsu's second-rate art. Afterwards, he left the village and joined Akatsuki. His specialty was the creation of bombs by infusing a material, preferably clay, with his chakra through the mouth on his hand. The best part was that if he molded a soft material into an animal, it would come to life and commit a suicide attack on the target. The second man, Kakuzu, was a 96-year-old man who originated from the village Takigekir. Apparently, he was trained as an assassin in order to kill the first Hokage, Hashirama Senju. After he failed, he was cast aside by his own village. Betrayed, he stole the village's most powerful technique, Earth Grudge Fear, and left to become a bounty hunter. The Earth Grudge Fear gave him the ability to detach and reattach body parts with many living black threads and consume the hearts of his victims. With that process, he could prolong his own life and take his opponent's powers for himself. This gave Kakuzu an extensive library of deadly jetsus. The third man was his own uncle, Nagato. However, most of his memories were fuzzy, and Naruto couldn't make much of it. He walked into the small seaside town where Akane Resort was settled when he heard something odd. His increased senses picked up footsteps where he was standing. 
The odd part was the fact that he was completely alone. The street was empty. Naruto deduced that there had to be some underground path underneath the surface of the street. He decided until he heard something pollicular. A gruff voice was softly yelling to a crying child. Shut up, stupid brat. You slaves should be glad to be sacrificed to the revival of our Lord Zeref. Naruto angrily growled as he knew who Zeref was thanks to his mother's lessons. Fiyama taught him that Zeref was a dark mage that lived 400 years ago. Zeref used the forbidden death magic to kill masses of humans and wrote a book filled with ideas for powerful demon summonings. Unfortunately, he managed to create several of these demons already, some of them being Lullaby, Agnologia, Doriarte, and Deliora. Also, the part where the man called the child a slave didn't sit well with the 11-year-old dragon slayer. He decided to dig down and follow the group to see if he could help them. He flashed Throck two hand signs. Dotan, Mogirigakura no Jutsu. Earth release, hiding like a mole technique, and sunk into the ground as if it became a liquid. He soon dropped out of the ceiling of a stone tunnel. Without a sound, he decided to follow the voices. He soundlessly ran throughout the tunnel until a large group of people came into vision. The largest group of people all had sad, desperate, and grave looks on their faces. They were dressed in rags and looked like they had all been beaten recently. Naruto was disgusted as there were children, not even six, and old people aging over the eighty between the slaves. The other group of men were all dressed in similar blue executioner's outfits. All of them held staffs, and some of them even held swords or axes. They were eating a feast, while the slaves looked like they could just keel over from hunger. A little girl with snow-white hair of approximately nine years old shyly walked up to one of the guards. See, can you please share S some F food with us? We are all very hungry, and dash. Before she could finish her question, the guard backhanded her and began hitting her with the blunt end of his staff. Who the F-U-C-K do you think you are, E-H? Asking for food. We give you enough. A roof over your fucking heads, two slices of bread a day, and a purpose in your miserable fucking lives. And still you dare to ask U.S. to give you more food? You ungrateful little bitch. The little girl kept crying and repeating, I'm sorry, I'm sorry over and over again as the guard kept hitting her. After a while, Naruto had enough and hinged his outfit into a slave's rags. He sealed his weapons into his scroll and sealed his scroll into a temporary seal in his wrist. Nagato is his uncle. Seals of this caliber are nothing, he then shunshined into the cave in the middle of the crowd and ran towards the guard. Naruto then punched the man straight in the nose, breaking it and flinging him back. He then hardened his skin slightly and received the beating that was meant for the girl, like a man. You little shit. You broke my fucking nose. I'll kill you, I'll kill you, I'll. Fucking. Kill. You, the man roared in a mix of agony and a blood rage before the other guards restrained him and kicked Naruto back into the crowd. Naruto softened his skin again and laid still. After a few minutes, the little girl limped towards him and kneeled next to him. Hey, are you okay, mister? She asked him before he opened his eyes again and smiled at her. He stood up, stretched his back and offered her a hand. Yes, young lady. I am fine. How about you? Did he hurt you very much? He asked her with a kind smile plastered across his face. The girl blushed a little bit as she took his hand and pulled herself up. She winced a bit when she put strain on her left leg and fell forward. Before she could hit the ground, however, Naruto put his arm around her chest and supported her. He put her arms around his neck and scooped her up, carrying her bridal style. Her blush intensified, but kept quiet. Naruto walked over to the group, where a small group of children of approximately nine or ten years old sat together. One boy, an auburn-haired boy with unnaturally pointed ears, jumped up. Angel. 
Are you okay? Did he hurt you? The boy rattled on in concern of his friend. Naruto laid her down and examined her leg. He saw that her leg was bruised badly and broken in several places. As he carefully prodded her leg, she winced in pain and the boy pushed Naruto away. Stop that. You're hurting her, he cried out. Naruto shook his head and smiled disarmingly. It's great to see that you care about your friend like that but I was just checking her leg for any broken bones or internal bleedings. As for now, she has three fractures in her left leg, so we have to make a splint to keep the fractures from worsening. Could you please go look for a stick or a plank? The boy nodded hesitantly and ran off to go look for a piece of wood. Naruto made sure no one looked and pulled a piece of cloth out of his seal before he went back to Angel and waited for the boy. After about five minutes waiting, the boy came back and gave Naruto a few pieces of wood. Thank you. Eric. The name's Eric. Yours? Naruto. He replied to Eric before he focused back to Angel, who followed the conversation attentively. Angel, that was your name, right? Angel nodded. Angel. I need you to bite into this stick. I'm going to re-break your leg so that the bone will regrow straight. It'll hurt a lot, but if I don't do this, you might have to limp for the rest of your life. Just bite in this stick to relieve the pain a bit, okay? She nodded and bit down onto the stick. Eric, I need you to hold her arms down. If you don't, she'll trash around and there will be a chance that the bone gets worse. Eric nodded too and held her hands against the ground above her head. Ready? he asked both kids. They nodded, and he carefully pushed two pressure points on her lower leg. Angel grimaced and bit down on the piece of wood slightly harder. When Naruto felt the cracks, he lifted his hand, hardened his skin, and made a quick karate chop. Tears leaked from her eyes as she began trashing around. She bit down hard on the piece of wood in order to not scream her lungs out. Naruto quickly did three more chops, and with each chop, he softly muttered, Forgive me. By the third chop, her leg was numb from the pain, and she calmed down. After four more chops, Naruto asked Eric to hand the piece of wood. He placed the piece of wood against her leg and wrapped the cloth tightly around it. By the time he was done, Angel was sleeping soundly. Good job, Eric. Thanks for your help. Eric nodded and lied down next to her. Naruto, also exhausted, lied down next to Eric and promptly fell asleep. The next morning, they were pushed into ships. For the next three days, Naruto, Eric, and Angel got to know each other on board of the ship. For instance, Naruto learned that Eric had a creepy obsession with snakes and poisons while Angel wanted to find her little sister, who was separated from her when she was younger. Naruto hadn't told them about his magic or ninjutsu yet, but he knew that he had to reveal himself sooner rather than later. He also made friends with Urza, Jalal, and Rob. Urza was a nine-year-old girl with scarlet red hair and a rebellious, spunky personality. Jalal was a blue-haired boy with a strange red tattoo crossing his left eye. Just like Urza, he was spunky and rebellious. Also very self-sacrifical, which Naruto saw as a good thing. The third one was Rob. An old man, well within his seventies, with long white hair and a long white beard. His eyes were permanently squinted, but in a friendly way. The most prominent thing about this skinny old man was the fact that he had a humongous black hummingbird-like creature tattooed on his back. Rob told them that he was once a member of the infamous mage guild, Fairy Tail. At that news, Naruto nearly jumped a hole in the roof and made a note to himself to ask about it later. As they were pushed out of the boats, Naruto saw the tower. It was huge, made of stone, and looked like it wasn't done by a long shot. They were pushed into the tower, where a large one-eyed man stood there grinning. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to our humble abode. For the next years, you will work, eat, sleep, piss, and shit here. 
This is your new home, your new lives, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Hell. Chapter 4, Tower of Heaven Part 2, The Fall. Click, click, click. It was the only thing that could be heard in his eye, the chambers of the Tower of Heaven. The clicking of pickaxes on stone, along with the occasional whiplash and screams of pain. Naruto was aggravated. Not because of his pain and labor. He could care less about that. Not because of the fact that his magic was being blocked by his cuffs. No, he couldn't stand the fact that these cult followers were sacrificing innocent lives for their cause. In his eyes, slavery, rape, and murder were the three most unforgivable things. Click, click, click. The sound itself was aggravating. Click, click, click. As if it had been mocking him for the past 18 months, the monotone sound kept continuing, occasionally driving someone insane. Click, click, click. He shifted eyes to the guard. The fat tub of lard was currently eyeing Angel with lecherous eyes. Sick bastard, he thought, but decided to keep quiet. Without his magic, he couldn't harden his skin. This made the beatings worse, and if he used chakra now, he would only exhaust himself. Something in these cuffs restricted his chakra. Possibly the physical energy that he needed to mix with his spiritual energy, seeing as he used etherano as physical energy. Though he noticed that if he ate some of the stone, he refilled a tiny portion of etherano inside his body. So for the past 18 months, he secretly ate loose pieces of rock, heads of broken pickaxes, and even loose pieces of lacrima to build his power back up. Soon you sons of bitches, soon. He thought as he popped another piece of rock into his mouth. He could feel his reserves build up with each passing moment. Naruto was brought out of his musing by another scream of pain. Normally this didn't bother him, but this was a familiar scream. He frantically looked around, only to see Urza being carried away, and Jalal being beaten. H-E-Y, he roared at the guard that held Urza as he flung a rock. The guard turned around, and the rock socked him right in his left eye. The other guards threw lightning spells at him, but he ignored the pain, and kept throwing rocks at the man. The man yelped in pain, as he let Urza go. Urza immediately ran over to Naruto and hid behind his back. Naruto pointed his thumb at his own heart. Whatever it is that she's done, I'll take the blame. If you need to punish someone, take me, just don't take your own shit out on an eight-year-old girl. As Naruto was grabbed by the shoulders by two other guards, Eric, Angel, Sho, Wally, Simon, Jalal, Emiliana, and Urza watched in disbelief at his stubbornness, while Rob watched with a mix of pride and sadness. Pride for the fact that Naruto voluntarily sacrificed himself for his friends, and sadness for the fate of the poor child. Naruto was dragged to the highest chamber and hung on a cross by straps. Hours of mindless torture went by, but Naruto refused to even grunt. Whiplashes on his chest stung like crazy, but he simply refused to make any sound. He was slashed across his arms, legs, and stomach, but it had hardly any effect. In fact, after a while the pain went numb, and he started grinning. The torturer was also getting more and more aggravated. You won't even grunt, eh? The man grumbled after 24 hours of continuous torture. Naruto grinned. And not a fucking chance, you monster, he spat the last word as if it was venomous. The man grinned wickedly. Well then, if physical torture doesn't work, then let's try mental torture. He beckoned for one of the guards. You, go get one of those little brats from the fourth floor. He turned back to Naruto. Let's see if any of your little friends wants to have a little talk. A few minutes later, footsteps could be heard and the door opened. The guard returned, and Naruto's blood ran cold. There the man stood, holding Urza by her hair. The poor girl nearly burst in tears when she saw Naruto's form, beaten and bruised, cut up and burned, hanging from a cross. The torturer cut the straps of Naruto's straps, and the boy fell to the ground in a heap. 
The guard led Urza go, and she ran to Naruto's broken form. She kneeled down by his head and hugged him, crying. The torturer then grabbed both of them by the neck and separated them. He threw Naruto into a wall and hung Urza onto the cross. The impact knocked him out, but he could hear faint screams fading into the darkness. Hours later, he cracked an eye open. He felt like shit, but didn't care about that. He shakingly stood up and examined the room. It was almost empty, almost. On a cross across the room hung Urza, softly crying. Naruto's blood ran frigid as he ran over to the girl and unstrapped her. She fell into his arms and clutched his shirt. H.E. wrapped his arms around the broken girl and hugged her close, whispering into her ear. Soon afterwards she fell asleep. He examined her and was shocked to see that they removed her right eye, leaving the poor girl with one hazel eye. Naruto then decided. They went too far this time. This time, my patience has run out. I'll kill them. All of them. He spiked his magic energy and broke his cuffs. Feeling his natural etherano return, he sighed in relief. He made a clone and ordered it to take Urza to a safe place. As soon as the clone disappeared, he tapped into his power. No mercy. Yuryu no Yoroi. Lava Dragon's Armor. H.I. skin hardened to a point where it became as hard as Fiyama's rock skin, and it turned blackish. H.I.'s eyes were now pools of purple light. As soon as he opened his mouth, steam escaped, and embers flew out. He took a step back and spoke in a distorted voice. You can run, but you can't hide, motherfuckers. Your time is up. He lifted his hands as a memory of his uncle surfaced. He gathered energy in his hands and with Aurora Shirado, Azura and Oriisa. Azura Path, Azura's laser, his hand split apart as if it were a machine, and a hole in his wrist opened. A blue beam shot from the hole and burst through the steel door and the wall opposite from the door. The guards in the hallway were immediately charred beyond recognition and those who survived the initial blast were quickly killed by the aftershock. Naruto stomped the ground and fell through to the next floor. The fourth floor was very spacious and thankfully empty right now. Naruto grunted from the impact and immediately headed for the cells. He gathered heat in his hands and grabbed the locks. The heat melted them and the gates flung open. Eric, Angel, and the rest immediately cowered back as Rob stood in front of them. Why are you here, monster? Naruto chuckled and shook his head. Have I been away for so long that you forgot my face? Rob J.I.J.I.? Naruto asked as he reverted to his normal form. Tears pooled in the old man's eyes as he grabbed Naruto by the shoulders and pulled him into a hug. Thank Mavis. You're all right. We were all worried sick when you were transported to the torture chamber. We never heard anything from the guards, so we thought you died up there. Then they took Urza, and dash he stopped M.I.D. sentence in realization. My God. Urza. Is she okay? Did they hurt her? Where is she? Naruto cast his glance down. For now she's fine, but they tortured her for hours and took her right eye. I took her to a safe place for now, but before I am going to get her. I need to do one thing. What is it? Eric questioned him and Naruto looked back up, his purple eyes burning with determination. To raise hell and tear this shitty tower apart. H.I.'s voice distorting again as he re-entered his armored state. He turned around, seeing a large group of guards gathering to stop the rebellion, he smirked. Naruto took a deep breath and cupped his hands in front of his mouth and roared. Cultists of Xerif, you have gone too far and invoke my anger. You have murdered, raped, enslaved innocents and tortured many innocent people. Turn around and leave, or else. The cultists all laughed as the leader of the group channeled lightning magic into his staff and snorted. Or else, he asked mockingly. 
or else I'll invoke something I'd like to call fuck everything in that general direction Naruto yelled back, gathering chakra into his left palm for a Bakutan jutsu. Before the cultists could raise their staffs and fire spells, Naruto slammed his hands onto the ground. Stone make, Bakutan, Jizatsu Gorimu. Stone make, explosion release, suicide golem. A large golem made of bluish rock rose from the ground with a roar. Its torso reminded the prisoners of a gorilla, while its lower body was more like a goat's with two legs. Purple energy leaked from the cracks in the stone. The golem turned its arms into swords, and with a mighty roar, it charged at the group of cultists, hacking and slashing its way to the center. When it arrived in the center of the group, it let itself get surrounded, and it kneeled down. The golem raised its hands and clapped. As soon as its hands connected, it roared again, and it exploded in a massive red fireball, scorching everything in the room. Naruto slapped the ground again, and roared stone make IWA no cabe. Stone make rock wall, to protect the prisoners from a certain hot death. The explosion held on for ten full seconds. After the flames died down, Naruto lowered the wall, only to see that the entire room was reduced to ashes. Ashes to ashes, motherfuckers, he growled. As he melted the rest of the locks on the prisons, his hearing picked up that the cultists on the first floor also had an escapee. To his shock, he then got the memories of his clone, and found out that the escapee that they caught was Urza. He was so busy with listening to the voices downstairs that the blonde never noticed that one cultist survived his bomb and tried to stab him in the back with a dagger. Dai Mont's G-A-G-K, before the cultist could finish his sentence, a purple snake jumped from Eric's shirt and bit him in the neck. He man I am M I D I at least started spasming and foaming from the mouth as he fell to the ground. Naruto turned around and saw the snake. He smiled and petted her head. Good girl, Kubel IOS, thanks. He whispered, before running off to the first floor. Once he found the cultists, he came across a shocking scene. Chaos. The cultists were all bleeding, running and screaming as swords, axes, spears and daggers flew at them and attacked them as if they were being handled by invisible soldiers. In the middle of the room stood Urza. Surrounded by a purple light as a magic circle on the ground glowed. The girl was in some kind of trank as she kept crying and screaming his name. Naruto quickly deduced that when his clone popped, she thought he died and that the shock awakened her latent magical abilities. He quickly joined into the skirmish and made short work of the rest of the cultists. Urza was now exhausted and shaking. Suddenly she started falling, and just before she hit the ground, Naruto caught her. He then led the prisoners to the boats, yet again, using J.I. Satsu golems to take care of any remaining guards. When every prisoner was loaded on TH boats, Naruto handed Urza to Rob. Just go on ahead, I'll take care of the tower. When the boats were a safe distance away, he gathered a humongous amount of chakra in his left palm and placed his palm on the outer wall of the tower. Bakutan, Jigen Bakuhatsu, 2BU, explosion release, timed explosion, 2 minutes. The tower began glowing brightly, and Naruto started water walking towards the ships. When he arrived, the tower glowed white, and it was consumed in a massive explosion. Water started filling the place where the island once was, and Naruto sat down on the deck of the ship and fell on his back. The battle took a lot out of him, and he abruptly fell asleep. Rob smiled brightly, thinking, You have a bright future before you. Naruto Naruto, Magma Dragon, Chapter 5 So, what are you going to do now? Naruto asked his friends. The rather large group of friends all stood there, gathered in Naruto's hotel room at Akane Resort. Their boat stranded only a mile away from it, and the hotel happily offered rooms for the night. Rob got Naruto his own room, so that he could sleep his fatigue away in peace. When Naruto woke up, however, he could see six different colored mops of hair sticking up from around his bed, and he could hear soft snores. 
Jalal, Urza, Eric, Angel, Sho, and Simon sat on the floor, leaning their backs to Naruto's bed with swords and spears in their hands, snoozing away. The thirteen-year-old dragon slayer smiled silently at the sight and shook the awake. They started talking a bit until Naruto asked his question. Simon, Wally, and I are going to try and get a job here. Sho said before he looked at Naruto. I'm going to the guild that my mother told me about. Naruto said, answering Sho's unasked question. Jalal and Urza's ears twitched at that. And which guild is that? Jalal asked politely. Naruto grinned widely. Fairy tale, of course, he exclaimed happily. Mom said that fairy tale accepts anyone as their own family there and that they're supposed to be really strong. Jalal smiled. So did Eric, Urza, and Angel. You know what? That sounds like a pretty good idea. If you don't mind, could we join you? Jalal asked Naruto with an expectant look. Naruto nodded, and the four others cheered. Naruto climbed out of his bed and went to get dressed when he saw himself in a large mirror. His chest and upper arms were littered with scars and bruises. He knew the bruises would eventually fade, but the scars wouldn't. The long whip marks would be embedded into his skin forever as a reminder to the hell he went through and the defiance he showed to protect his friends. He grinned softly at the memory of his defiance towards the torturer and put his clothes on. In the corner of his eyes, he could see Urza standing there. She showed a smile that didn't completely seem right. The smile never really reached her eye, and Naruto made a decision. He went downstairs with a determined expression on his face. At one of the tables sat Rob, staring at the sea. The old man was sunken in thoughts and jumped a little when Naruto tapped his shoulder. Naruto, my boy. Don't scare this old man so much, he mock lectured the boy. Naruto just grinned sheepishly. Sorry, old man. Say, you know healing magic, don't you? Rob nodded with a raised eyebrow. Yes, I do, but what for, my boy? Naruto's grin disappeared and was replaced with a serious look. I want you to heal Urza's eye. Rob sighed gravely and shook his head. Listen, Naruto. Even in my prime, I couldn't heal a missing body part like that. I can give her a new eye but someone else has to sacrifice their eye for her. But where are we going to find someone who wants to give up their eye? Use mine. Naruto growled. Rob's eyes widened in shock. Well, what did you just say? Naruto's face showed nothing but determination. I said, use mine. Use my eye as sacrifice, exchange my eye with hers. Mom taught me some sensory skills, so I won't be handicapped anyway. It's my fault that Urza lost it in the first place, so I'm the one who will bear the consequences. Rob chuckled and soon erupted in full-blown laughter. You remind me of my old teammate, Naruto, he said between laughs as Naruto looked dumbfounded. Old Makarov was just like you, powerful, short-tempered, gentle, wise beyond age, and stubborn as hell. The only thing that tells you apart is the fact that Mackie is a major pervert, and you're not. However, the one thing in which you two are truly alike is your determination to give everything up for the sake of your comrades. Naruto felt a bit of pride when he was compared to the legendary Makarov Dreer, and smiled sheepishly again. Very well. Go get Urzo while I prepare the Tans Plantation spell. Naruto blindfolded Urza and led her outside to the beach. Naruto? Why are we going outside? Urza asked the boy and Naruto grinned. You'll see. By the way, your birthday was in a month, right? Urza nodded softly. He took off her blindfold and she could see Rob standing next to Naruto. Rob's hands were coated in red magic and Naruto merely smiled. It's a little early, but happy birthday, Urza. Rob put his left hand over Naruto's right eye 
and his right hand over Urza's right eye socket. He grunted in concentration and called. Kokan Mahu, Hatsudu. Exchange magic, invoke. Naruto didn't feel any pain, but more of an uncomfortable sucking sensation as his right eye was being exchanged with Urza's empty space. When Rob was done, he was sweating from the strain of using his rusty magic skills and sat down for a bit. Urza opened her eyes and was shocked that her right eye was back, but she became sad when she noticed that Naruto's eye was gone. Why? she asked, her voice shaking in restrained sadness. Naruto grinned as he pulled a long white bandage out of his pocket and covered his empty eye with it. It's my fault you lost your eye in the first place, so I felt like I should have returned it to you. You idiot. I lost my eye because I defied that torturer. I told him that I'd rather suffer and die than to lose my friends to him. To lose you to him. She mumbled the last part, but forgot about Naruto's unnaturally high senses. I don't care about that. The reason you were tortured in the first place was because I never even released a grunt to the bastards. So I believe that it's my fault. And by the way, he cupped her face with his right hand. He lifted her face so that she looked directly at him. One brown eye and one purple eye. A pretty face like yours deserves two eyes, he finished with a brilliant heartwarming smile. The sun shone directly at his back and coated him in a brilliant light as he said that. Urza blushed a little bit and hugged him, burying her face into his chest. Naruto stroked her scarlet hair softly and sat down with her. Three days later, Naruto, Urza, Jalal, Eric, Angel, and Rob said goodbye to the rest of the group. Simon, Wally, and Sho found a job at the resort as bellboys, and Miliana decided that she wanted to join the all-female guild, Mermaid Heel. Rob said that he'd show them the way to fairy tale before he would permanently retire as a member. Maybe I could help old Yami at the council, he joked as he told them that. The journey was uneventful. They were ambushed once by some highway bandits, but a straight Yuri no can, Lava Dragon's Fist, stopped them dead in their tracks two days. They traveled on foot before they finally reached Magnolia. Rob grinned mischievously as they stopped at the door of the guild and pulled back his leg. He kicked the saloon style door open with full force while yelling, I'm home. An old dwarf with a funny hat immediately dropped his beer and flew straight at Rob. After the two got reacquainted, Rob introduced Makarov to the children. He told the guild master about Naruto's strange magic, the breakout, Naruto's sacrifice, and the children's goal to join Fairy Tail. Malarov scratched his chin and mentioned the children to follow him. When they arrived at his office, he handed them all a flyer. If you'll just fill them in, then I'll just give you your stamps and poof, you'll be official members. Naruto looked at the flyer and saw that it was fairly simple to fill in. Name, Naruto Uzumaki. Age, 13. Place of birth, unknown. Magic, S. Lava Dragon Slayer, Iron Make, Stone Make, Ninjutsu, Detachment Magic Asterisk, Explosion Magic, Rinnegan Magic, Slight Sensory Magic. Reason for appliance, to grow strong and protect my friends. Makarov accepted his flyer and, while smiling, raised an eyebrow. The others were done and Makarov raised another eyebrow. Urza? Why did you write a question mark at magic, S? Urza looked down a bit. Because I don't know what my magic is. All I know is that it makes weapons fly and attack my opponents. Makarov scratched his mustache and thought. I see. Well, going by your description, I'd say that you're a telekinetic. Someone who is able to move things with their mind. It's one of the most versatile and useful magics out there, so you should consider yourself lucky, young lady. He then turned to Eric, Jalal, and Angel. Also, if the three of you want to learn a magic style, you need to find a teacher or a magic shop. I can sense a lot of potential coming from you, so make me proud, he said with squinted eyes and a massive smile. The three kids smiled back, and Naruto leaned to the wall. 
The master opened his drawer and grabbed a stamp. Now, all I need to know is which color you want your guild stamp in and where you want it. Eric chose a red stamp on his left shoulder blade. Angel chose a white stamp on the palm of her right hand. Jalal chose a black stamp on his right calf. Urza chose a blue stamp on her left bicep. And Naruto chose a large brown stamp covering his entire upper back. When the stamping was done, Makarov removed Rob's old stamp and wished him good luck in error. He then sent the younger children downstairs and asked Naruto to stay behind. Why did you want to speak to me, Ji-san? Naruto asked in confusion. Naruto sat behind his desk with a serious expression. Well, first, I want to thank you for getting all those slaves, including Rob, out of that hellhole. Naruto waved it off and said that it felt like it was his duty. Second, I have a few questions regarding your magic. Naruto nodded. Okay, shoot. First, your amount of magic styles and the fact that you say that you have dragon slayer magic. Care to elaborate? Naruto then told Makarov all about his childhood. Living with Fiyama, training in the hellish circumstances of the volcano and the day he had to leave. He explained that his uncle left his powers and that of two comrades behind for Naruto to take in his life in the Tower of Heaven. He told Makarov in all honesty that he killed every single cultist in a fit of rage when he discovered Urza's condition. When he was done, Makarov just sighed and smiled. He patted Naruto on the shoulder and spoke the words that Naruto would never forget. Don't fret about it. While fairy tale members treasure all life, there will always be a time where we don't have a choice. A time where we are pushed beyond our limit. A kill or be killed situation. I understand you had no choice and only killed them because you wanted to protect your Nakama. Like my old master used to say, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. As long as you never enjoy killing, you will always find a home in fairy tale. Naruto stood up, tears streaming down his uncovered face, and he bowed from the waist down. Thank you, Makarov Jichan. All right. Now get down there and meet your new family. Makarov laughed as Naruto ran out the door and jumped down the stairs. The old master smiled and sat down on the edge of the second floor while lighting his pipe. The will of Mavis is strong in this young generation. I look forward to see what they can accomplish. Chapter 6, S-Class Exams, and What? It has been two years since Naruto joined Fairy Tail along with the others, and to be honest, they couldn't be happier. Like Makarov said, Naruto was forgiven for his past sins by the other guild members. Naruto, Urza, Jalal, Eric, and Angel quickly rose in the ranks of the mages. Naruto was now a high A rank mage, bordering low S rank with his many different magic types. Urza picked the art of sword fighting up, along with an extensive requip space, earning the title of Titania. Jalal went to a magic shop, and by a stroke of luck, he found an old book with the basics of heavenly body magic allowing him to use space-based attacks, like Meteor and Grand Chariot. Sure, it was a difficult art to learn, but he trained every day alongside the rest, and quickly grew powerful, earning the moniker Saint. Eric found an old dragon lacrima while he went on a mission with Naruto and swallowed it. His body transformed into that of a dragon slayer, and it turned out that his element was poison. This gave him the nickname Cobra. Angel decided that she wanted to search for stellar keys and bought the silver Selim key, and Naruto gave her the golden scorpion key. He got it as a reward for a high rank mission and decided that he didn't want to use it. Her pure white hair and outfits led people to calling her Fairy Tail's White Angel. Naruto himself was known as the Hunter. The reason for that was that he often chose jobs where he had to hunt down and capture missing criminals, animals, or even beasts like wyverns and vulcans. Naruto found out that he could use his Lava Dragon Slayer magic to make quicklime. 
with that he'd simply set a trap and make sure that his victims would get stuck. From there on, he'd drag them along to the nearest rune night station and drop his targets off. He got to know most of the guild members and made some very good friends. He met Gray, who joined two months after him, Natsu, who joined one month ago, the Strauss siblings Lisanna, Elfman, and Mira Jane, Jet and Droy. However, he mostly hung out with Levy and Kana. He met Levy a couple of days after he joined the guild. Apparently, Makarov found her in front of the guild when she was only a few days old and raised her as one of his own kids. Unlike most members, however, Levy was a silent, shy girl who preferred reading a book in the corner over participating in one of the many guild brawls. Something Naruto shared with her. They often talked about good books and went to the bookstore together. On the weekends, Levy often trained with Naruto to expand her magic abilities. Much to the ire of Jet and Droy. Kana interested Naruto with her latent unnaturally high magic potential and she enjoyed just hanging around him, drinking the day away. Much like Kana, Naruto turned out to have an inhuman alcohol tolerance and once even outdrank Makarov, Kana, and Mikau. Naruto was taught how to draw by Ritas and Makarov taught him how to imbue magic into lifeless objects, giving those objects slight magical abilities, so he often drew new cards for Kana to use and made small trinkets for the rest of the guild. Even Laxus once got a small pendant that slightly increased his lightning magic and is often seen wearing it. Naruto and I, I fight me came the voice of the 11-year-old dragon slayer. The now 15-year-old Naruto sighed and put his beer on the counter before he swept Natsu's feet away and Roundhouse kicked him into Wakaba, who in turn threw Natsu face-first into Eric's back and started another guild brawl. Levi and Kana decided to sit next to the blonde one-eyed teenager. Levi was only 12, but was already showing signs that she would grow up to become a beautiful young woman. She had shoulder-length blue hair and big hazel eyes. She wore a yellow sundress and white slippers. Under her arm was a thick book. Kana was a cute 14-year-old and already showed signs that she was going to be a curvy bombshell in the future. She had long brown hair and deep chocolate-colored eyes. She wore an orange sundress and a white hairband. In her hand was a stack of custom-made tarot cards. Neruchan Levy happily called as she sat next to the boy. Want to help me with some runes? Naruto smiled and nodded. The two of them leaned over the thick book and started to translate the ancient language. Ella S. E. Mina, O. Archaea Vagoni, F. Onax Tun Iroa, she said with some difficulty, but Naruto lightly bopped her head. You misspelled Vagoni. The runes do look like each other, but you're using the wrong word. The sentence is, Ella S. E. Mina, O. Archaea Draco, F. Onax Tun Iroa. The translation is, Come to me, O ancient dragon, cried the hero, not come to me, O ancient wagon, cried the hero. Levy giggled at her silly mistake and went back to her translations until an empty mug hit Naruto in the back of his head. He slowly turned around and literally jumped into the bar fight. He dodged a chair thrown by Jalal and jumped over a low-flying Eric before Roundhouse kicking Mira in the chest and to Urza and Judo throwing Wakaba into a table. Natsu jumped into Naruto's neck and tried to chew his ear before Naruto grabbed him by the waist, held him upside down, and crashed him headfirst into the floor with a roar of Uzumaki-style, legendary tombstone of pain, a loud snap could be heard, and the entire guild went silent. Naruto checked Natsu's pulse and waved them off, showing that the salmon-haired boy was okay. He then shot back with a nosebleed. The other men followed Naruto's line of sight. On a table lied Urza and Mira. Knocked out. On top of each other. And their lips actually touching. Some of the younger men then too shot back with bleeding nostrils. Naruto lied on the ground in a pool of his own blood, and he raised a thumb. Best. Guild. Ever, the men on the ground all raised their thumbs and nodded sagely. 
Makarov then walked up to the stage, nose slightly bleeding, and coughed to get attention. The men wiped their noses, and Naruto sat back down on his chair between Levy and Kana. As you might know, the National S-Class exams are coming up again, and the council wants to hold a battle royal between the four most powerful guilds, Fairy Tail, Blue Pegasus, Lamia Scale, and Phantom Lord in five days. Unfortunately, they have already chosen who they want to see in this four-way battle, and I'm forced to oblige this demand. For the residential of you, don't worry, the Guild S-Class exam will still be held next month. Which four members have been chosen, asked a random guild member. Makarov coughed and held up three files. The four that have been chosen are, for Lamia Scale, Jura Nikis, for Blue Pegasus, Ichiya Vandalay Kotobuki, for Phantom Lord, Gajil Red Fox, and for us, Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto nearly fell off of his seat when he heard his name being called. Sure. He was confident in his abilities, but he had heard rumors that Iron Rock Jura and Black Steel Gajil were monsters on the battlefield. Beating the two of them was not an easy task, also the last member, Ichiya was not someone to mess around with. Makarov tossed him the four files. A little bit of info on their abilities. Don't tell anyone. Makarov said jovially. Naruto shook his head and opened the three files. He read them a little bit before closing them and sighing. A dark aura appeared around him as he began to chuckle. Jichan. It seems that my food has arrived. Five days later, era. Naruto, Makarov, and Naruto's little team stepped out of the coach, and both Naruto and Eric immediately ran towards the nearest trash can to throw up. Angel rubbed Eric's back while Jalal patted Naruto on the shoulder. Naruto now wore a simple black kimono, with his sword hanging from his waist, and a leather three-strap eye patch with a golden fairy tail mark stitched into it. Kenpachi's from Bleach, but then with the mark. Seriously. I love my magic. But I hate the motion sickness, he grumbled. Jalal just laughed a bit. A few minutes later, the group walked into one massive hall as a frog person, WTF Mishima Sensei, led them to the waiting room. The room was filed with the other contestants. A short man with a ridiculously large nose and orange hair dressed in a white tuxedo, accompanied by two boys and a fat bald man wearing a leotard and lipstick. A shaved 17-year-old teenager wearing a white kimono and black G.I., accompanied by an elder woman who constantly twirled her fingers. And finally a black-haired teenager of Naruto's age, with studs everywhere and a nasty look on his face accompanied by a blue-haired girl and a middle-aged man wearing a jester costume. As Makarov went to talk to the other masters, Naruto walked up to the bald teen. Yo! My name's Naruto Uzumaki. What's yours? He extended his hand to the boy, and the boy accepted. Juranikis. Pleasure to meet you, Naruto Dano. The orange-haired man walked up to the two boys. Ah. The perfume of budding friendship. How wonderful, he said in a sing-song voice. My name is Achiya Vandalay Kotobuki. Don't forget that. Men. Naruto and Jura politely bowed to the strange man and introduced themselves. Gajil just scoffed. What a load of shit. Friendship between enemies. Naruto turned around and grinned while sticking out his hand. Don't be like that Gajil-san. We might have to fight each other later on, but that doesn't mean that we can't get to know each other. Before Gajil could respond, Jose grabbed his shoulder and smiled deceptively. Sorry, Naruto Kuen. We phantoms do rather not associate with you fairies. They turned around and Gajil smirked. I'm gonna destroy you, you little shits, he growled as he stuck out his tongue. The groups chatted for ten more minutes when another frog messenger came in. Will the audience please move to the seats? The battle will commence in three minutes, everyone left, but Urza gave him a final hug. Ichiya and Jura smirked knowingly while Gajil pretended to throw up. 
The gate opened and the four mages walked into a massive stadium. Each went to one corner. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the annual National S-Class exams. This year the exam will consist of one four-way battle royal between the four top guilds of Fiori. From Lamia Scale, Iron Rock Jura. From Blue Pegasus, Ichiya Vandalay Kotobuki. From Phantom Lord, Black Steel Gajil. And from Fairy Tail, Naruto the Hunter Uzumaki. Let the fight begin. A bell rung and they all ran to the middle. Ichiya went and grabbed a bottle from his pocket and threw it at the ground. Perufa Mumeho, Mahi. Perfume magic, paralysis, a yellow cloud erupted and enveloped the mages. Naruto quickly held his breath and went through hand signs. Futon, de tapa. Wind release, great breakthrough, the pushed his hands outward and expelled a large wall of wind, dispersing the cloud and throwing both Gajil and Ichiya back. Jura, however, stomped his foot on the ground and shot a pillar of stone at Naruto's abdomen. The pillar connected and shot Naruto back. Naruto's feet dug into the ground as he tried to keep his balance and he dug two small trenches. You want to play that game? So be it. Iron Make, Kami no Ken. Iron Make, God Fist, he slapped his hand to the ground and behind Jura a massive steel fist erupted, hitting him and flinging him upwards. Naruto then moved to the side as a steel spear hit impacted in his previous spot. Gajil had gotten up and transformed his arm into a massive metal spear. Have a taste of this G.I. High. Tetsuryu no Y.A.R.I. Iron Dragon Spear, his arm shot back and a volley of metal spear hits flew at Naruto. Naruto sorted through his memories and found a suitable technique to escape any harm. His eye flared up and he stuck his palm out. Shinra Tensei Heavenly Subjugation of the Omnipresent God A sphere of pure gravitational force erupted around Naruto and impacted against the spear hits. Said spearheads were flung everywhere and one even impacted Gajil's own shoulder. The team roared in pain and staggered a bit. Seemingly out of nowhere, Ichiya came dive-bombing out of the air and threw another bottle, this time at Gajil. Perufa Mumeho, Sagan S-U-R-U. Perfume magic, restrict, a blue cloud erupted this time, and Gajil coughed a bit, signaling that he breathed it in. Ichiya then got two bottles and stuck both of them in his own nose. Perufumu Meho, Chikara no Perufumu, Shunsaku no Perufumu, Zero Kyori. Perfume Magic, Power Perfume, Fleet Foot Perfume, Zero Distance Inhalation, the short man took a deep whiff and was surrounded by a magical aura. He suddenly grew insanely fast. He became eight feet tall and highly muscular. Suddenly his face didn't look out of proportion and the man ripped out of his tuxedo, leaving only his pants. Jura suddenly crouched down and began to build up his power. Gajil jumped out of the cloud, covered in metallic scales and blue lines. He seemed to have a hard time moving with the shoulder wound and restriction perfume. Mama. Naruto just drawled out. If you guys are going all out, his skin got covered with brownish rocky scales, and his eye became a purple flame as he activated his Yuri no Yoroi. I guess I shouldn't hold back either, his voice distorted to its dark raspy tone as smoke and embers flew out with each word. He picked one of Gajil's spearheads and bit the tip off. Soon the entire thing was devoured and orange lines reminiscent to magma covered his chest. Just for you, I'll show you the newest technique I've been working on. He took a deep breath and crouched. To the surprise of everyone present, Naruto's shoulder blades opened up and revealed small holes in the rocky substance. Yuriu no Kazan Funka Lava Dragon's volcanic eruption, his jaw opened wide and a mass of steam erupted from his shoulders. From his mouth, a massive flaming wall of hot rocks shot at his opponents at high speeds. Jura was hit in the chest with the rocks and flew backwards into the wall, leaving a large crater. Gajil tried to move out of the way, 
but the restriction perfume wouldn't allow in, and he too was shot into a wall. Both men were knocked out cold. Ichiya managed to avoid most rocks thanks to his fleet foot perfume, but his massive size allowed multiple rocks to hit him in the chest and shoulders, leaving a few burn marks. Ichiya managed to stay conscious and looked at Naruto, who returned to his normal form. Naruto walked slowly to Ichiya and stuck his hand out with a smile. Do you give up? Ichiya-san? Ichiya accepted his hand and shrunk again. I'm a man who knows when he's defeated. The perfume of defeat is sour, but I have to accept it. You win, Naruto-san. Naruto nodded and slapped his hand onto the ground. Two golems erupted from the dirt and walked over to the craters. They pulled the other fighters out and slung them over their shoulders. And the winner of the National S-Class Tournament is Naruto Uzumaki, the announcer cheered. The delegation from Fairy Tail was estetic at their win and Makarov was congratulated by Baba Sama and Bob. Jose, however, seemed furious that his prized Dragon Slayer lost. The man accepted Gajil from the golem and turned around with the unconscious team without a word. Jose walked off and Naruto looked with pity at Gajil's KO'd form as the two slipped into a hallway. Jiro woke up and congratulated Naruto with his win. It was an honorable fight, Naruto Dano. I hope that we can meet again and spar some time. Naruto nodded. Naruto felt someone tap his shoulder, and he turned around. A frog messenger gave Naruto a letter and hopped away without saying anything. Naruto opened the letter, and a tiny magic circle appeared, showing the hologram of an old man. Dear Uzumaki Naruto, We, of the Magic Council, are pleased that you have won your title of S-Class Mage. We have watched your performance via Alacrima and were impressed with your massive power. We wish to meet you today. The meeting will commence in 20 minutes in room 5. Makarov can show you where it is. Please do not make us wait. Sincerely yours. Crawford Seam, Chairman of the Magic Council. The circle vanished, and so did the image of the old man. Makarov sighed gravely and told the others to go find the cafeteria while he and Naruto would go see what the old farts wanted. Eric, Urza, Angel, and Jalal walked off, chatting excitedly with Jura and Ichiya, while Baba-sama and Bob silently followed them. They're fast. Makarov grumbled and Naruto raised an eyebrow. What do you mean, Ji-chan? I mean with their decision regarding you. Normally they talk for months about this kind of stuff before they finally reach an agreement, the old man mumbled cryptically. Scene change. The council room was massive. Just like everything else in era, it was big, blue, and over the top. In front of Naruto sat ten old people, one of which Naruto recognized. Rob Gigi. Naruto exclaimed happily as the old man chuckled. Most other members bristled at the tone the teenager used. Don't use such a tone to a council member boy. Orc said in his stuck-up tone. Naruto shot a glare at the old man and then smiled sweetly. Shut up, would you kindly? I'm trying to catch up to my grandfather figure here. The image of a snarling demonic fox head appeared behind the boy, shocking the man into silence. Yajima just laughed and the rest was shocked that a young boy used such a tone at a member of the Magic Council. Seem then coughed into his hand, gaining the attention. Naruto Uzumaki First off, congratulations with your promotion to S-Class Wizard. It does not happen often that one as young as you gains this rank. Naruto nodded in thanks, but kept quiet. That brings us to the second point. During your battle, we did readings of each of your magical powers, properties, and reserves, and we found something interesting. We measured that your magical receives are to be frank, insanely big, and incredibly dense. In fact, the size and density of your reserves even exceed those of Makarov Drear. Both Naruto and Makarov went wide-eyed at that, and their jaws hit the ground. With that, 
we of the Magic Council have unanimously agreed to make you an offer. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and I want you to know that this hardly ever happens. Naruto, having a sneaky suspicion about the opportunity in question, nodded for the old man to continue. We of the Magic Council wish to make you one of the ten wizard saints. What? Both Naruto and Makarov roared in disbelief. Singh chuckled a bit and stood up. Rob explained to us what you did at the Tower of Heaven. He told us that you used a massive amount of magic and yet stayed in control and took out the cultists. He also told us that you blew the tower up and still managed to get away when you were 13. This is also the reason why we chose you to participate in this exam. We wanted to see your power firsthand. Now that we have seen what you can do, we all agreed on this point. So, do you accept? Naruto thought about it for a while. I do have some terms. First off, I want to stay as a fairy tale member. Second, I want to study under Jichan as a wizard saint, and third off, I want to customize my wizard saint uniform as I see fit. Seem mulled over the conditions for a bit, but then nodded. Then I, Naruto Uzumaki, S-class mage of fairy tale, accept your proposition and become a wizard saint. A slash in and cut. See you next time. Chapter 7, Agnologia, Man vs. Dragon Oh sweet Mary, mother of fuck that's good. Naruto sighed as he sipped his coffee. Currently, he, Happy and Natsu were sitting behind the bar in fairy tale. Mira was cleaning glasses as usual and everything was perfect. Which Naruto found slightly unsettling. Normally there was always something going on in the guild hall. Natsu and Grey fighting, Makarov perving over the girls, Naruto, Makao and Kana holding a drinking contest, Urza scolding said people for drinking during daytime or Levi asking Naruto to help her decipher some impossible runes. But here's the problem. No one was there. Grey was, ironically, staying at home with a cold. Makarov was currently getting drunk while being paid at his bi-monthly guild master's meeting. Macau was at home watching his two-year-old son Romeo. Levi, Kana, and, God forbid, Urza were on a mission together. Jalal, Angel, and Cobra were requested to help in a restaurant in town. Poor guests, Cobra unintentionally poisoned any food that he got his hands on. So that left Naruto, Natsu, Happy, and the rest of the guild in a bored mood. So bored! Natsu exclaimed, not raising his head from the counter. Immediately Naruto perked up. Nothing stayed calm for long if Natsu said that. Last time Natsu said that, Naruto had to fight a herd of pissed off wyverns. In the middle of the night. Naked. Both young men decided that what happened that night in the forest should stay in the forest. Not even three seconds after Natsu said that, the guild's front doors opened up, and Levi, Urza, and Kana came stumbling in. Each of them was severely wounded and looked as if they were on the verge of collapsing. Mira gasped as both she and Naruto ran over to them to catch them before they hit the ground. They carried the girls to the medic bay, Narrett with an unusually grave expression etched on his face, kicked the door open and laid Urza and Levi onto the beds while Mira put Kana onto the bed. As he hooked Urza onto and four, she grabbed his hand and opened one eye. She managed to grit out three words that made his blood run cold. Agnologia is the coming. She rasped out as she fell back into unconsciousness. He turned to Mira and saw that she was done bandaging Levi up. From what town came their mission, he asked in an icy voice. Mira flinched slightly at the normally gentle man's demeanor before she answered. Acadia town, but what are you dash? Gather my barrels of clay from the basement. About ten of them, no, make that twenty. Take them to the mess hall. Get Natsu to help you and make it quick. She nodded hesitantly before running downstairs. Naruto looked at the three girls' sleeping forms before nodding to himself and heading downstairs. When he arrived, 
Natsu and Mira just rolled in the last two barrels. Thank you, you too. Now stand back a bit, he ripped his left sleeve off and activated his shirado. From the elbow down, twenty arms sprouted, each with a mouth embedded in them. The mechanic arms sunk into the barrels filled with clay, and each of the barrels began to glow blue, before Naruto pulled the arms back and deactivated his shirado, reverting his arm to its normal state. The mouth on his arm began to chew slowly and Naruto turned around. Natsu checked one of the barrels and found that it was empty. I consumed all of the exploding clay and stored it into my body to gather Etherano. If I can believe Urza's words, then Agnologia itself is coming this way. Acadia is only ten hours away from here by horse, so if no one stops it, it will arrive at Magnolia in three hours tops. I'll try to hold it off for as long as possible, but I don't know if I can defeat it. Mira, I need you to contact the master for me. If Agnologia is only half as powerful as the stories go, I will need the old man's help. Natsu. I need you to gather Cobra, Jalal, and Angel for me and send them after me. Without waiting for an answer, he marched out of the guild and gathered Etherano into his feet. Shirado, Kakaishin no Tsubasa, Azura Path, Wings of the Machine God. The soles of his feet opened up, and he was propelled into the air by two massive purple flames. He shot off at top speed, appearing as a blur to those who weren't trained in such speeds. About half an hour into his flight, he saw a black blob flying right at him. The closer he got, the more pronounced the blob got. It was a massive black dragon with shining white eyes, black feathery wings, and blue tribal markings covering its scales. It was easy the biggest beast Naruto had ever seen excluding Fiyama, and he instantly knew that he had to pull every trick in his book just to make a shot at defeating the beast. Hey, ugly! Naruto roared at the beast, gaining its attention. Catch! He threw his left arm out and created several large clay birds that closed in on its head before exploding into a sea of flames. The shockwave made Naruto stagger in midair. There. That's ought to get its focus on me, he though grimly as the beast shook its head a bit in irritation. How dared this insignificant fly try to harm him? Him. The beast that was feared by humans and dragons alike. The beast decided to humor the foolish insect a bit by playing with him before eating him. It screeched at Naruto and flew straight at him in an attempt to bite him in half. Naruto shifted his weight and shot out of the way, before spitting out a massive clay spider that latched itself to Agnologia's right wing. The spider then fell apart into several smaller spiders that crawled all over him. Bakutan, Kumo no Shin and Waiyu. Explosion release, spider infestation. The army of small spider bombs exploded at the same time, throwing Agnologia off balance for a moment, but it returned the favor by whipping its tail at the blonde dragon slayer. The tip of the tail connected with Naruto's right leg and redirected the propulsion flame, shooting Naruto away a few feet. Naruto managed to restabilize himself, but noticed the gash on his upper leg. Shit that hurts, he thought before gritting his teeth. Mom's warnings about him really are accurate. This guy is truly powerful. It took two explosion barges head on, and only its feathers are a bit ruffled up. Those explosions cost me three barrels each, leaving me with seventeen left. YouTube, fairy tale Ost, a blaze that burns evil hearts. No choice, huh, he mumbled. More to himself than to his opponent. He sighed a bit before swiping his thumb over his bleeding leg and smearing the blood onto his wrist. With a poof of smoke, Naruto unsealed her subsidian sword. He focused on the warmth that the blade that contained the lava dragon's essence and added it to his own. Time to take off the kitty gloves. Yuryu no Yoroi. His skin took on the familiar rocky texture as his eye turned into a purple flare and embers flew out of his mouth with every breath. Iron Make, Tetsu no Yama no Yari. Iron Make, Iron Mountain Spear, he grunted out as a 25-foot-long spear grew out of a magic circle. 
The edges were serrated, and it was shaped like a trapiantic star with deep grooves. He roared his head flung both of his hands forward and let his magic guide the spear to its target. The spear impacted into Agnologia's neck, cracking a few scales, but before it could do more damage, the apocalypse dragon swatted it away with its tail. God damn it. Not even that works, then how about this? He channeled his Etherano into the sword, making it grow to the size of a claymore, and he wrapped it with purple flames. As he swung the sword, a massive purple flaming version of Fiamma's head flew at Acnologia, whose patience was running thin. It rode her, and the shockwave forced the flames apart, dissipating the technique. Naruto inhaled deeply before bellowing. Yuryu and Ohuko, he expelled a massive stream of liquid rock and steel that headed straight for its target. The stream hit its target and the sheer heat caused Acnologia to growl in irritation. Still not enough, then this will be my last attack before I run out of Etherano. You truly are a fearsome beast, taking my most powerful blasts like that and just shrugging it off. However, I hope that this will work. Uzumaki Nisatsu Rendan Uzumaki Second Combo He focused Etherano into both of his hands. Shinra Tensei Heavenly subjugation of the omnipresent god, a transparent dome-shaped barrier was expelled from within Naruto, throwing the dragon back a bit. He pointed his right arm at the dragon, and five more arms sprouted from the shoulder. Three arms split open into their laser forms, and three arms pooped open from the elbow down, revealing dozens of missiles. Shirado, Ashura no Riisa. Masera Danmaku. Azura Path, Azura Laser. Missile Barrage. Before Agnologia could set itself straight in midair, three blue lasers impacted into its back, while dozens of explosions riddled its sides, throwing it even more off balance. Finally, Naruto gathered all of the 17 remaining barrels of clay into his hand and formed it into a massive statue of Fiamma. The white clay statue roared viciously as if it was alive and dove at the unbalanced Agnologia. Bakutan, Fiamma no Fukushu. Explosion release, Fiamma's revenge. The white clay dragon grappled Agnologia and gave one final screech before erupting into a humongous dome-shaped explosion with Agnologia taking the full hit. The shockwave tore trenches into the ground below and scarred a mountain. Naruto focused his propulsion on his back. Six holes opened up and each expelled massive purple flames, yet Naruto was still being pushed back by his attack's aftershock. After the deafening rumbling stopped and the smoke cleared, Naruto could see an absolutely pissed Dragon King flying in midair. Its eyes glowed blue as it inhaled deeply. Naruto's exhaustion finally kicked in as his armor cracked and crumbled. His flares were flickering, and he had a hard time just staying suspended in midair. So this is the power of a true dragon, huh? Karuto rasped out in annoyance. The creature took his most powerful attacks, and still stood up. Agnologia was done gathering its etherano as it prepared to obliterate the pest that infuriated it. It aimed, and... Dokuryu no Huku. Poison Dragon's Roar. Gyurin Chario. Grand Chariot. Kasan. Light Ray, exclaimed three voices behind Naruto. A reddish beam, a yellow flame, and a white beam struck Agnologia on the side of its head, throwing its aim off. The massive roar missed Naruto and impacted the sea, leaving a large maelstrom behind. Naruto turned around to see Cobra, Jalal, and Makarov sitting on top of Cubilios. Cobra grinning at the blonde while the other two stared in amazement at the destruction caused by the two. Oi, Cyclops. You look like shit. Cobra yelled before Naruto flipped him off. I still look better than you fuckwad. Naruto jabbed back and Makarov couldn't help but chuckle at the fact that the two could still mess around like that in this kind of situation. Agnologia was losing its interest in the fight. The human had entertained him for a while, but the human used up all of its power and was now worthless. Then when he decided to end the human's existence, three other humans interfered. 
the dragon growled in annoyance. It decided to ignore the humans and be merciful for once. After all, the humans had been able to hit him, which was no small feat by itself. The dragon turned around and changed its course to the open sea. Naruto was about to chase it, before his exhaustion fully caught up to him, his propulsion finally gave out, he fell unconscious and he plummeted down. Cubilio's dove after him and wrapped her tail around him, before flying back to the guild. Makarov just looked at Naruto the entire trip in amazement that an 18-year-old man was able to hold off the great dragon F.O. the Apocalypse. Of course Naruto wasn't an S-class mage, and a wizard saint for picking his nose, but this was something even he himself would avoid at all costs. Naruto Uzumaki You never cease to amaze me he thought fondly before the massive flying snake touched the ground in front of the guild. Makarov used his titan magic to enlarge his hand and picked Naruto up. He kicked the double doors to the guild open and immediately called for Mira. The two dragged Naruto to the sick bay and let him rest on one of the remaining beds. Mira stitched his leg up and figured out that Naruto was just incredibly exhausted. Combine that with the amount of blood that he lost due to Agnologia, and they were certain that he wouldn't wake up for at least three days. Naruto, my boy, you've grown up to be a splendid man and an even greater wizard. I'm sure that Fiamma would be proud of you, was the last thought of Makarov as he turned the lights off and closed the door behind him. This is the end of this story. Sorry if you wanted more, but got abandoned. Thanks for listening, though.